Nutrition misinformation is rampant. It's hard to know what to believe when one day a website posts about Kim Kardashian getting sick on the keto diet, to less than 24 hours later that very same diet being the answer to all our problems. How are we supposed to know what to believe? Dietitians are frustrated with nutrition messaging online. It now seems that popular opinion trumps science. Please stop drinking apple cider vinegar. It's going to ruin your teeth. Contrary to popular belief, carbs aren't going to kill you. And I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but megadosing with vitamin C isn't going to speed up your metabolism. It's just going to give you the runs. Like most dietitians, I've tried to combat misinformation with science. We do our best, but oftentimes it feels like we're failing. I want to share science in a way that actually makes a difference. And for a while, I thought I was. But it turns out everything I learned about sharing science was wrong. I'm going to tell you how we're killing human connection with science. And most importantly, how we can make science meaningful again. I loved science growing up. It's why I decided to go to university to become a registered dietitian. It was this perfect mix of biochemistry, physiology, and fueled my desire to help people. Through my degree, I learned to access and interpret science. It was this incredible tool I could use to fight nutrition misinformation and debunk myths. And with the culmination of social media and the internet, just about anybody could look credible and spew the most ridiculous misinformation. From Dr. Oz claiming high levels of chemicals lurk in the foods we eat every day. How could you not click? To Gwyneth Paltrow saying Cheese Whiz is worse than crack. I'm pretty sure no food is worse than crack. Kind of dramatic, but doesn't it kind of make you feel like you shouldn't eat it anyways? To coming from our most reputable sources, how did we not know coffee enemas were essential? Because we have 15 kilos of toxins in our intestines. Guys. When is it we started trusting people that squirt coffee up their butts as a credible source of nutrition information? <laughs> I'll tell you when. When nutrition messaging online became about fear. Fear-based messaging ticks me off. It's what captures our patient's attention and creates this veneer of credibility by misusing research. Luckily, I have science, my superpower. My friends like to do joke that I turn into the Credible Hulk when confronted with misinformation. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry because I always back up my rage with facts and documented sources. <laughs> so equipped with science, my registered dietitian credentials, and my ability to turn green when angry, I went off to save the world from all the misinformation out there. I didn't know it at the time, but the science I was so passionate about could actually get in the way of helping my patients. As healthcare providers, we all have those patients. The ones who got away. The ones you tried your very best with but weren't able to help. Leaving you wonder what you could have done differently. And making you question if what you're doing is actually making a difference. Christy was my one who got away. Nutrition oncology was a special place to work. Nutrition is so integral in cancer treatment. It's the one thing patients feel they have control over when their world gets turned upside down. This can be really powerful and positive, but can also leave patients vulnerable and exposed. Of course, patients want to do everything in their power to cure their cancer. And when someone online makes a claim it's possible through food, it's so incredibly tempting. What harm could food do? And what if it worked? Christy was a 34-year-old mom of two, diagnosed with terminal breast cancer. They asked me to see her because unless her nutrition status improved, she couldn't get her next round of palliative chemo. This was the chemo keeping her disease stable and allowing her to spend more time with her family. So I asked how she'd been eating, and she said, well, obviously I don't eat sugar. I've cut out carbs in anything that isn't raw, so no meat or dairy. I've been juicing for all my meals and trying to get my antioxidants to fight my cancer in that way. I know I can starve my cancer cells back into remission. People have cured their cancer with juicing, which I'm sure you know. This is the move patients use to defend themselves, to define their behavior as a belief, daring us to challenge the information. 
But I knew science didn't have to be a defense mechanism. Instead, I could use it to show Christy how important nutrition was. I said, the challenge with juicing is you're just not getting enough nutrition to stay healthy for more chemo. Well, this wasn't the right thing to say because she snapped. I can't believe you don't know this. Juicing cures cancer, and everyone around here just wants to push drugs to keep my cancer stable, but there are natural remedies that nobody here wants to talk about. My heart started racing. The trust was breaking down. I had to win it back. I had to convince her. I attempted to answer as compassionately as I could with science. I said, the challenge with juicing is you're just not getting enough nutrition. And a lot of times, anecdotal advice is put online, and it isn't going to help your cancer. Um, a lot of people put it online, and um, it's, it has a lot of misinformation in it. All of my science ammo I mounted against her juicing. She was being deceived by a false promise, and I had her best interest at heart. As healthcare providers, we're taught to address misinformation by explaining the science, by finding that motivating factor. For Christy, how could it not be more time with her family? I was doing what I was supposed to do, but it only drove us further apart. Why did she trust Joe Blow Nutrition Blogger and not my degree? Christy never got her next round of chemo. It was delayed and delayed until she was transferred to the palliative care team. She passed away from a mix of malnutrition and her stage four breast cancer, leaving her daughters and her husband behind. I think back to Christy now, and my heart physically aches. Did Christy fail my nutrition intervention, my nutrition science, or did my nutrition science fail her? I didn't get this right, and I couldn't figure out why but it impacted each interaction I had with patients. How could I make them believe the science like I did? Eventually, I went on to start a private practice specializing in irritable bowel syndrome and gut health. I myself have IBS and know how frustrating it is to live with a condition you're often told is all in your head. With the incredible amount of stigma around it, it's no wonder patients turn to social media and Dr. Google to find answers for everything conventional medicine wasn't able to give them. And boy, do they find answers for just about everything. From activated charcoal to bind toxins in the gut, to needing a cleanse to kill parasites and candida, to fear-mongering about gluten and gluten and more gluten. Holy crap! Talk about nutrition information overwhelm. To combat these fear-based messages, I started using social media to get people to take food and their bowels a little less seriously. As you guys already know, poop jokes aren't my favorite kind of joke, but they're a solid number two. Using humor and sharing my IBS story was a way to connect people to credible advice. Was it acceptable? I didn't know. What would it mean for my reputation? As healthcare providers, we're taught to keep ourselves separate from our patients. We're there to deliver education, but don't get too attached. Yes, exercise compassion, but draw that firm line in the sand. I'm your healthcare provider, you're my patient. But my experience with IBS taught me that people want to know they're not alone. So I trusted my gut and I shared my stories, even the most embarrassing ones. Trust me, nothing is more mortifying than having your new boyfriend take you to emergency for what you think is your appendix, only to get scoffed at by the ER doc in front of what will probably soon be your ex and be told, go home, there is nothing wrong with you. You're just constipated. That actually happened. That's not my most embarrassing story. And poop is a conversation for 20 plus years of marriage, not less than 20 days of dating. <laughs> but as I shared my story, something funny happened. I had people call me up to say, you get what it's like. I've been to Emerge for constipation too. I felt dismissed and embarrassed too. And these people who heard my story and connected with it became my patients. In turn, I asked their story, their frustration, their mortifying moments. 
It was the opportunity to ask, where did this start for you? What's it like living with IBS for you? The ability to bear witness to our patients' stories is a powerful part of their healing journey, and one they've often never had the chance to share. Shockingly, this approach required me to put science away for a minute and focus on something else, human connection. I was finally starting to get it. Taking what I learned about connection, I used it to better understand how my patients were making their health decisions. Case in point, my patient Pat. Pat found me through a post I had written on Instagram, a haiku about poop. My humor allowed us to connect, and it made Pat feel like I wasn't just going to tell her what to do and send her on her way. She had done a lot of research on her own, Dr. Google, finding messages like five steps to curing IBS from a seemingly credible website, not evidence-based, to almost losing a loved one to conventional therapy, fear-mongering, to pureed meat for better digestion. This one comes from one of the top IBS influencers online and is just a plain old bad idea. Pat was drowning in nutrition information. It overwhelmed her and she was at a complete loss of what to do. Pat is not unique. I bet you the majority of you have felt confused, overwhelmed, inundated, or fearful because of nutrition messaging online. So I asked Pat to tell me what had been going on. She said, well, obviously I can't eat gluten, and then named off another 10 critical dietary restrictions she had picked up along the way. I like to joke with my IBS patients that they're kind of like crazy cat ladies, but instead of collecting stray cats, we accumulate dietary restrictions and end up keeping them all. All of these nutrition decisions, supposedly for her health, were so negatively impacting her quality of life. Her friends stopped inviting her to dinner, she felt like her husband didn't know what to do with her anymore. She was torn between actually living and living in fear that if she didn't do everything right, everything possible to help her guts, she was somehow going to make things worse. Nutrition messaging online assumes nutrition is the cause and the solution to all our problems. How many times have you heard, I can't believe you eat that. Don't you know it's bad for you? Talk about judgment and how quickly we are to define ourselves by food. There's status, identity, virtue tied to the willingness to take care of ourselves through food. There's the social expectation that we could always eat better and do more. Unfortunately, it's these messages rooted in fear and comparison that capture our patients' attention. And unless we address those fears, we cannot make a difference in these patients. Because what emotion trumps fear? None. So what was Pat actually looking for? I could have easily explained why she didn't need to follow a gluten-free, nightshade-free, fun-free diet with science to back up what I was saying. But I'd been down that road before and it didn't matter that I had science to back it up. She had people with lived experience telling her otherwise. What I needed to know to do my job well was why. So I asked, what do you hope eating a gluten-free diet will do for your health? What impact do you hope it has? She said, huh, that's a good question. I could see her racking her brain, trying to remember exactly what it was she had heard about gluten other than it was bad. So I reframed the question. What are you afraid of happening or not happening if you eat gluten? I paused. You know, the power of silence, until it was uncomfortable. <laughs> After probably what felt like eternity to Pat, she looked at me in surprise and said, I think I'm worried I'm going to get colon cancer like my dad did. My dad had IBS and they missed colon cancer until it was too late. I don't want that to happen to me. She began to connect the dots and said, I think that eating gluten-free will make sure my bowels don't get inflamed and that my IBS doesn't turn to colon cancer. It's these questions that need to happen before we get to the science. It's addressing fears in a nutrition landscape that cultivates fear by misusing science. I said, wow, that must be terrifying for you. Living in fear that eating gluten is going to cause colon cancer? Do you think it's true that eating gluten causes colon cancer? She said, doesn't everybody know gluten's bad? I thought it was just a thing. 
She said it as though it was as factual as the sky was blue. But then she asked, does gluten cause inflammation in the gut? This is our opportunity, not before. Understanding why a patient is making a health decision is far more powerful than explaining the science will ever be. Many times patients aren't even aware they're making fear-based decisions. They're just doing it because they think they should. Slow down. Hear their story. Help them to understand their decision process. This opens the door for critical thinking. Pat and I were then able to discuss where this information came from, why it's not true, and what it means to her. I watched as she breathed a visible sigh of relief and couldn't help but think back to the girl I was when I counseled Christy, the girl who had thought science was enough. Healthcare providers have chosen the field of healthcare because we care. But when we prioritize science above common humanity, our care can feel empty and hollow. We shouldn't be surprised patients are trusting anecdotal advice, social media, and bloggers for health information because messages that create fear can feel so connecting. Our job isn't to fight that misinformation with science. It's to help our patients understand how misinformation affects them. And to do that, we need to connect wholeheartedly. Connection isn't made through the knowledge you have or the degree you hold. Patients need to know, like, and trust you, which is why I'm challenging you, in the interest of sharing science, to actually put science away and connect. Next time you see a patient, can you get some skin in the game? Ask them to tell you their story and hear how their experiences have shaped the fears and beliefs they hold around their health. By listening, by really listening, we can learn to identify the fears, barriers, and objections that exist because of nutrition messaging online. From there, we can get them to question those messages. Where does this information come from? Do you think it's true? And what if it weren't? Oftentimes, a gut check is enough. Nutrition science is rarely sensational or extreme. If a message creates fear, that tightness in the chest, that guttural reaction, it's probably not true. If that message comes from a celebrity or influencer, offers a big promise, or villainizes food, food or a nutrient, it's probably not true. Get your patients to trust that fear is telling them something and get them to curiously question that message. It's when they're ready to ask those questions that science comes in, not before. Only then can we use science to add context to their story, offer a shift in perspective, and help them to develop critical awareness about how they're making their health decisions. In the interest of making science meaningful to our patients, let's put science away and connect.